Okay, good afternoon. Today is March 30th. Welcome to the bill hearings for the Ways and Means Committee. So the Senate is still in, so I will just call the senators' names when their bills are up. And if someone from their staff is here, that is fine. Otherwise, we'll just keep going down the list and circle back. Uh, and if members, well, you're not going over now to testify on bills because they're not in. But if members start to leave because the Senate is not here or is, is back across the street, then um, members might leave. So first, Senator Griffith, is anybody here from her office? Okay. Is anyone here from Senator Gazzoni's office? Yep, come on up. Sen calling Senate Bill 363. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Lolo Dioye, here on behalf of Senator Gazzoni to present Senate Bill 363, Video Lottery Terminal Proceeds, Purse Dedication Account, Ocean Downs Race Course Operating Loss Assistance. This bill passed the Senate unanimously and was amended to add co-sponsors. By statute for the last 12 years, Ocean Downs Racetrack has been reimbursed for racing operational losses up to $1.2 million. This money comes out of the standard bread purse dedication account and has no effect on state money as seen in the fiscal note. This bill converts the $1.2 million to a daily number of 30,000 so that Ocean Downs can raise additional days without returning to the legislature for approval. Your committee has already heard the cross file of this bill, House, House Bill 455, which passed both this committee and the House unanimously. Thank you and I ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 363. Committee, if you do have bills, the Senate just got out. Senate Bill 721, Secretary Anderson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Wilkins, and, uh, and committee members. For the record, I'm Kevin Anderson. Secretary of the Maryland Department of Commerce. I'm here to testify in favor of Senate Bill 721, which reinstates the Maryland Employer Security Clearance Cost Tax Credit Program for eligible costs incurred between January 1, 2023 and January 1, 2028. This program has three components. First, it offers a credit for administrative expenses incurred by a business as they obtain and maintain federal security clearance for their employees. Second, it offers a credit for some of the construction and renovation costs of a sensitive compartment and information facility, or SCIF. Finally, it offers a credit for the first-year leasing costs for certain small businesses doing security-based contract work. All of these three components help lower the cost of doing business for small and early-stage businesses doing business with the federal government. And as we all know, we have a strong and vitally important federal and military presence in Maryland with agencies and facilities including the NSA, the FDA, NIST, the Aberdeen Proving Ground, Fort Meade, Pax River Naval Air Station, and many others. Our robust industry of defense contractors who work with our federal and military partners depends on having clearance to do sensitive work and review classified information. This has been a popular program. In its inaugural year, Tax year 2013, 39 businesses were certified. The number of companies applying for credits has increased to 86 applicants for tax year 2021, and the program has been oversubscribed for the 2 million available under the statute. Governor Moore has made increasing Maryland's competitiveness the core of his economic agenda. This program helps make sure that our defense industry, particularly our small business startups, can compete for these vital federal contracts. This is a unique program which gives Maryland a strategic advantage against other states and shows our commitment to our innovative companies. For these reasons, the Department of Commerce believes this is a valuable program and one worth extending. You should hopefully also have in your packet testimony from businesses expressing their support for the program and how it has impacted them. I do want to note that the bill was amended, amended in the Senate in two ways. One amendment restarts the program for cost incurred beginning on January 1st of this year instead of retroactive to 2022. This was at the request of the Comptroller's Office. 
The other amendment restricts the program availability to companies with 500 or fewer employees. Commerce is comfortable with both of these amendments. We respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 721. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Secretary Anderson? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony. Oh, I didn't see you. Sorry. Delegate Plakovich Carr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Does the department have any um, data that they can share with the committee or in a follow-up in terms of what the, the size of the businesses that have been receiving the credit to date are, um, given the Senate's amendment on 500 employees? Uh, I do not have it on hand, but I'm sure we can get that to you right away. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's attached to the testimony. I'm t Thank okay. you. Great. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 721. Secretary Anderson, Senate Bill 549. Great. Thank you. Once again, good evening, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Wilkins, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, my name is Kevin Anderson, Secretary of the Maryland Department of Commerce, and I'm here to present Senate Bill 549 on behalf of Governor Moore. Senate Bill 549 is the exact cross file of House Bill 552, which received a unanimous favorable vote from this committee and passed in the House 128-10. This legislation will create the Build Off Future Grant Pilot Program within commerce to leverage state dollars and provide funding to support infrastructure that houses tech-driven industries. This includes cyber ranges and skiffs for the security sector, wet labs for cutting-edge biotech and quantum computing, and manufacturing centers for next-generation production and more. The funding set forth in this bill will provide innovative industries with the resources they need to start up and grow. Under the Moore Miller administration, we will build an ecosystem of innovation and economic growth, and this bill sets us on that path. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration, and I ask you for a favorable report on Senate Bill 549. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Secretary. Thank you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 549. Senate Bill 552. I almost said Delegate Lukey. <laughs> That's kind of you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Eric Lukey, Chief Legislative Officer to Governor Wes Moore. Um, Senate Bill 552 is an identical cross-file to House Bill 547, the Family Prosperity Act, which has already passed out of this committee and the House. I um, just want to leave you with two numbers since this committee has long supported the policies in these bills. Um, and those numbers are 400,000 and 40,000. 400,000 Marylanders who will be impacted by the permanent extension of the earned income tax credit, 40,000 Marylanders who will be impacted by the expansion of the child tax credit. This is one of the most substantive actions the legislature and governor are taking this session to reduce child poverty, and I appreciate the committee's support and ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 552. Senate Bill 553, um, Mr. Fallon, are you going to do that? Or you want me to call, call, wait and circle back to it? Okay, I will circle back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. Has anyone joined us from Senator Griffith's office, Chair Griffith, Senate Bill 452? Okay, Senator Augustine, I'm looking for your bill number here. Just come on up at 699. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Atterbury, um, for letting me come up. Since I'm here, I'm grateful. Senator Malcolm Augustine, Senate Bill 699, um, which is an identical cross-file of House Bill 781. Uh, I just, uh, that's already passed this committee, and I would ask a favorable report. Thank you. Any questions for Senator Augustine? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 699. Chair Griffith, whenever you're ready, you can come on up. We know you guys just got off the floor. So take your time, catch your breath. Am I now? 
Yes. Hold on, then. Senate Bill 452. Welcome, Chair Griffith. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and House Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I'm Melanie Griffith, Senator representing Legislative District 25. I will catch my breath. Whew. Okay. I am so excited today to present for you uh, Senate Bill 452, which really provides support for one of the most exciting industries in the state of Maryland, which is the film industry. Now, some of you have, were not here when I served on the House of Delegates. I served on appropriations. And there was an effort to really attract film to the state of Maryland over the years. We've gone up and down in terms of our investment through this bill. We're hoping that we communicate to the film industry across the country, Maryland wants you to make film here. And so this bill makes modest changes to the existing program, the biggest of which is increasing funding for the film industry incentives to come to Maryland. You all heard a very similar bill um, that was sponsored by one of your members probably a month or so ago. The bills are very similar with just a few key differences that I'll point out. One of the provisions in the bill, and this was brought to me by some producers and filmmakers in Prince George's County, is that we cover uh, writers, producers, and director salary when uh, calculating the credit. Now, in the bill, we learned after the Senate passed the bill that some of that language actually had some constitutional issues because we wanted those writers and producers to reside in the state of Maryland. Apparently, Interstate Commerce says that we probably should not specify that in statute, so we would um, offer an amendment, Madam Chair, to modify that language. But the other provisions of the bill, very similar to um, Delegate Wells, we did also have differences in our bills to the percentage of credit that a film project could use, and we're certainly happy to work with her and modify the, the percentages as introduced. Uh, we kind of came in a little higher because we hoped to get $50 million, but that didn't happen due, the, due to the fiscal situation in the state. So Madam Chair, I know you have a long day. I know you all are familiar with the film industry and know what it can bring to Maryland, that when film is made in Maryland from Crisfield to Cumberland, from the low, low tip of the southern Maryland, St. Mary's County, to the east, west, north, and south, people work when film is made in Maryland. So I would ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 452. Thank you, Chair Griffith. Any questions, committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you across the street. Yep. <laughs> that concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 452. Is... Mr. Fountain, you're ready, good to go? Okay, Senate Bill 553, Secretary Woods. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much, and sorry for uh, holding things up. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Secretary Anthony Woods, and I'm here to present uh, Senate Bill 553 on behalf of Governor Moore. Um, the talented staff of the Department of Veterans Affairs and I are solely focused on serving those who serve all of us. Uh, this bill will help us to carry out that mission while diminishing financial factors that cause veterans to leave the state that they call home. As I serve in this role, uh, I am encouraged to know that I have the full support of the governor in focusing on important issues for veterans. Both this bill being a part of the governor's agenda and the governor himself coming here to present show just how seriously this administration takes this work. Uh, the bill itself is quite simple. Um, currently, Maryland exempts up to 5,000 for veterans under the age of 55 who are receiving military retirement income and up to 15,000 for veterans over the age of 55. As amended, this bill expands this exemption up to uh, 12,500 for recipients under the age of 55 and to 20,000 for recipients over the age of 55. This will save our veterans money and importantly, keep them home here in Maryland. I'll close by saying that Maryland veterans are friends and our neighbors, they're entrepreneurs, they're talented employees and lifelong public servants. 
when it comes to bolstering our sense of community and attracting businesses with our highly trained workforce, the investment set forth in this bill will provide immediate returns. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention to this important proposal, and I ask the committee for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the secretary? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 553. Is anyone here for Senate Bill 125, Senator Hayes' bill? Okay, we will come back. Senate Bill 354, come on up and just let us know who you are. So calling Senate Bill 354, Senator Giles' office. Thank you. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is Spencer Dixon and I am Senator Giles, Legislative Director, here to present SB 354 on her behalf. This bill would add a checkoff on the Maryland State Tax Income uh, Return to allow Marylanders to donate a portion of their income tax return to the Maryland Veterans Trust Fund. As you know, this bill was cross-filed with HB 316, which was heard in this committee on Thursday, February 9th, and passed unanimously by the full House on Thursday, February 23rd. SB 354, as amended, is in the exact same posture as HB 316, as amended. I therefore respectfully request a favorable report on SB 354. Thank you. Are there any questions, committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 354. Is anyone here for Senate Bill 469, Senator Elfrith's office? Okay, Senator Hedelman, you want to come up? Senate Bill 620? Oh, you have two, so we'll start with 620. Uh, one. Oh, oh, you're co sponsor Senate Hedelman. Sorry, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Shelley Hedelman, Senator from District 11 in Baltimore County, and Senate Bill 620 is um, in the, as amended, in the exact cross file posture of the vice chair. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today to ask for your support. It, the, do you want me to do a summary of the bill or no, no, no need? Okay. Appreciate, <laughs> happy appreciate June, you but. asking though. <laughs> uh, any questions for Senator Hedelman? Okay, seeing none, thank you thank very much. You. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 460. No, sorry, we didn't do that one. 620. Okay, now, is anyone here for Senate Bill 621, Senator Zucker's office? Uh, who are you here for? Uh, yeah, we just skipped over that one. Come on up. That's right. I know you. <laughs> Dylan? Hey, how are you? How are you? Uh, 469, right? Yep. Okay, Senate Bill 469. Uh, Madam Chair, Ma uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, I'm Dylan Baylor testifying on behalf of Senator Alfreth on Senate Bill 469, task force to study solar tax incentives. Um, at a broad level, this legislation creates a task force in the Maryland Energy Administration to look at and strategize and recommend solutions to our sta tax strategy uh, here in Maryland um, to better um, uh, strategize around solar deployment. Um, uh, since we passed our rigorous clean energy goals in 2019, uh, this committee and the Senate Budget and Taxation Committee have kind of done one-off approaches to um, incentivizing tax, um, tax incentives around solar, and um, this legislation tries to take a step back from that and look at it holistically to try and develop a more um, strategic statewide plan to uh, this problem. Um, there were a few Senate amendments. Um, one uh, was just to require that that the task force represents racial, gender, ethnic, and geographic diversity of the state, which is just uh, cookie cutter language that we put on a lot of task forces. Um, it adds representatives from organized labor, the Office of People Co People's Council, and the construction industry. And then it also adds uh, that the strategy uh, developed by this task force um, has to rec rec recommend solutions um, around community solar energy systems. Uh, since then, uh, we've also heard from a lot of different advocates that um, Rather than just looking at the tax piece of this, um, there might be, this bill might be an opportunity to have a, a conversation around uh, incentives generally around solar and solar deployment. So um, 
we also have, I think, Kristen Harbison from the League of Conservation Voters today who will, who will expand on that um, part of it, but uh, we've also talked to Delegate Feldmark about potentially expanding this task force to not just look at, look at task, tax incentives, but uh, incentives overall. So um, with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Okay, we do have two more folks coming up, but are there any questions uh, for Dylan from the Senator's office? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we have Drew Schmidt Perkins and Kristen Harbinson. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Drew Schmidt Perkins, and today I'm representing the advocates for um, Herring Bay. And if you haven't heard of this group, they're a small local community organization that over the last five years has developed deep understanding of the issues around solar siding and solar incentives. And today, I want to call attention to their testimony and the three key points that they like to make about this approach and some ways to make this bill just a little bit better. And um, the, the Senator's staff mentioned some of these things already. Um, so first, they recommend that we learn from other states. Um, Massachusetts tailors the, their incentives, I'm going to take this off, it'll probably be clearer, um, tailors their size of incentives to the project costs. New Jersey varies the SREC payments by size and location. California is studying the impact of these incentives on low and middle income households. It can work for them or against them. We think Maryland should be considering this. The second recommendation that the advocates have is to give MEA the time they need to study these incentives properly. This is pretty complicated stuff, as you all well know. And we want to make sure that the right incentives go to the right projects and not work against the kind of projects that we'd all like to see. Three, we want to ensure that the members of this task force are well chosen for their expertise that has to include tax and financial incentives, and knowledge of what some of these other states are doing so we can, well, plagiarize from those places and not have to start fresh. Finally, the advocates for Herring Bay have offered a small amendment that's very complimentary to the amendment you just heard to address these issues. And with this, I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm especially always happy to be testifying before my own delegate, Wells. <laughs> um, my name is Kristen Harvest, and I'm political director for Maryland League of Conservation Voters here in support of SB 469, and I thank Senator Elfrith for her leadership in this issue. In 2019, as you all know, Maryland General Assembly passed the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which set a target of advancing our state's renewable portfolio standard to reach 50% by the year 2030. And Governor Moore has furthered these goals by committing to 100% clean energy in Maryland by the year 2035. These ambitious goals are achievable only through continued bold action by this body. It also will require thoughtful consideration of the tools available to the state that can be brought to bear to reach these goals. SB 469 con seeks to contribute to this goal by, by uh, creating a task force to study the solar industry and tax incentives that can be offered to support development of the, a competitive industry. Maryland LCV strongly supports this goal and offers suggestions encouraging the committee, as mentioned, to broaden the charge of the task force to consider not just tax incentives, but other incentives available to the state, including the cost of solar renewable energy credits and the potential distribution of resources from funds supported by the alternative compliance payments for non-attainment of goals outlined by the Clean Energy Jobs Act. By examining the needs of different sectors within the solar industry and all available incentives and financing opportunities, including examining examples from other states, the task force can may create a plan that will allow Marylanders to better become a more competitive market for the solar energy generation. And we urge the consider committee to consider uh, to ensure that all necessary voices are part of the conversation as you consider task force membership. We hope, too, that the work of this task force will contribute to a larger needed conversation around, the, around energy siting by identifying ways to level the playing field for solar development on preferred sites. With this, Maryland LCV strongly urges a favorable report on SB 469. Thank you very much for the opportunity.
Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 469. Senator Zucker, uh, first we'll do Senate Bill 621. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, distinguished members of the Ways and Means Committee. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm sure you're wondering why I'm in here so much, and is it because I love you all so much? It is. And then I also have some good bills, I hope, but I love this committee, so uh, I guess I can't keep away. But um, I think, Madam Chair, I think I have one witness that is here, just in case you know, they're going to provide some testimony and also help answer questions. But colleagues, as you might remember, uh, and I know uh, Delegate Ebersol was knee-deep in this with uh, the sports gaming, and I know same with uh, Delegate Patterson. Um, and uh, what we're seeing in other states is uh, advertising about odds, and what, what this bill is is a consumer-friendly uh, bill that uh, uh, has been amended in the Senate, and as amended, Madam Chair and colleagues, there's no opposition, but what it does is it just gives the ability for the State Lottery and Gaming Commission to uh, work with uh, entities to sort of approve that they are legitimate entities, and it's really just to make sure that we cut down on some of the static that our constituents are seeing. I mean, I'm sure you can't turn on the TV without seeing uh, ads for sports betting, which is generating money for us, but we just wanted to at least provide extra uh, protections for our Maryland consumers. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, are there any questions? Okay, thanks. We have, we do have Chris Adams. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Adams. I'm the founder and CEO of SharpRank, which is one of the independent evaluators in this uh, amended bill. And, and um, what, what I, I come from a different world. I, I come from investment banking, um, where I went through months of studying for licensure, uh, SEC compliance, FBI background checks. Uh, and, and the founding of my company was based on hearing a radio ad with somebody uh, making claims about their ability that were statistically impossible to pick games, and then guaranteeing money if somebody were to call and buy the picks. Uh, and that uh, to me seemed like there was uh, a missing link in the integrity chain. So uh, that is uh, a bit about where the bill was initially structured and what, what the amended bill does is it allows for a licensure process to independent evaluators like us to be able to, if the sports book so chooses, um, license with them and, and operate with them to provide uh, audit services or independent evaluation for these sports books who employ influencers or content creators of their own or affiliates to the sports book. Uh, and and that, is, that is essentially what we saw as potentially a structural problem uh, with, with respect to sports betting. So I do believe that uh, almost the, the sports books here in this state and otherwise that are licensed and legal in this state are fantastic partners. Um, and I think what they have an opportunity to do is to legitimize and elevate this industry and put some much needed guardrails around it ahead of something uh, that would happen. So uh, that is, I strongly support the amended bill, uh, 621. I think it went through unanimously in the Senate, and I would encourage the same uh, favorable report. So thank you. I'm happy thank to you. answer any questions. I believe the, uh, Madam Vice Chair has a question. Thank you so much, and thank you, Senator Zucker, for bringing this bill and helping to make sure that we are safeguarding our this really important Maryland industry. I just wanted to make sure I understand it, some of the foundational aspects of it. We are looking in this bill to make sure, provide um, the opportunity to sort of take a look at an independent, objective look at content. We are concerned, and the problem that we're trying to solve, we're concerned that what might be happening. I wanna make sure I understand that. Uh, yes, so I can maybe take it back to uh, the founding of what my company is. Um, we heard, I heard a radio ad, uh, like I mentioned. I called the number, because I was a curious investment banker, 
I was given one side of the, of the game. I asked the passenger in my seat because I was curious, hey, just call this number, I'm curious. He was given the other side of the game. And so what, what, what we're really looking for is nefarious behavior um, and, and bad actors. That, that is what our company does. Um, but it's with respect to the content that's, that's being put out um, so that people know that they have a safe place to go. It is not based on performance. It's on um, fair, complete, accurate information being reported to the consumer. And it, it sounds like we have reason to believe that there may not be fair and accurate information that is being put out there by some of our licensees. Well, what I would say is, is that what we've seen, Madam Vice Chair, in other states is, is that um, there's been a lot of confusion around this and there's been bad actors in other states. We have not seen that in Maryland. This is just being more proactive, making sure that we have guardrails in place, but there's nothing to question um, how we've been proceeding. I think, I think collectively, because uh, I think the, this committee d did a tremendous job along with the House of Delegates in partnership with us, I think we have a good model moving forward on sports betting. This is just sort of foreseeing what can come down in the future and just putting in some guardrails. Got it, okay, thank you thank so you. much, Senator, I appreciate it. Delegate Hornberger, then Delegate Emerson. Thank you, Madam Chair. F fascinating bill and definitely support the concept uh, two questions. You're not looking to regulate a blogger or no. someone who's just tangentially no. affiliated with this, okay? Nope. And then the, this, the second part mm -hmm. of the question is, uh, the, you know, this is no different in my eyes, and you're in investment banking or were, than, you know, hot stock picks, you know? Invest in these stocks. These are ones that are hot. Is it, is it your intent to make sure that the, that the company itself that's offering the bets is not also giving advice that could be misconstrued or, or not line up with what's, what it's advertising? Because the ads that I'm hearing currently on the radio are the teasers, which is we'll guarantee you $200 even if you make the worst bet that we offer. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm just trying to figure out where the line is drawn. Um, would that be per continue to be permissible? You, you know, they're advertising a guaranteed win of $200 if you place a money line bet and open a new account. So if you could just clarify that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the intent, uh, or at least what we do, uh, is we focus on the content itself feeding into the sports book. So that okay. could be in-house content, uh, that could be an influencer who is paid to give out advice or whatever the case might be. Right. Um, with respect to um, guarantees or offers or things of that nature, we, ha we have no intention no, okay. of, of looking into the those. last so, question. So the answer, delegate, is no. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you. Cool. Yep. And then the last question would be, this doesn't run afoul of any First Amendment rights. I mean. No. And, okay. and I think it, the, the answer is no. I think there's other states that are moving this direction. But okay. that's why we're just authorizing, not mandating. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just to clarify, it would be in the best interest of a sports wagering book if half the people bet both ways on their bets because they set them up. That's where they make the most money. They're not it, ultimately. So what you're guarding against is the worst case scenario would be where someone who's giving advice gives advice to help the sports book get people to split those bets halfway down the middle. And so we're looking for a firewall here of sorts, aren't we? Yes, that, that, that's what we do. Um, yes, uh, we, that's part of what we do is um, that is the most advantageous position for, for a sports book to be in. And, you know, we, we don't uh, diminish the use of influencers or content to create engagement. We just want to make sure that it's safe and responsible for the public to consume it. And there's, uh, and uh, Delegate, there's other um, independent validators in the market. So that there's plenty of opportunity for Marylanders to have options for independent validators, but it's just important to have some. Delegate Buckle. That, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm, I'm trying to understand this. So what you're trying to regulate, because it talks about we can only regulate the actual licensees. So I'm not too familiar. I do a little bit of sports gambling. But I'm not too familiar with the licensee. And if I go on to DraftKings, I'm not too familiar with somebody saying, hey, 
it's Monday Night Football. The smart money's on the Eagles, not the not the Ravens. You know, that's where you should bet. Well, but they're the wrong. Eagles. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's you know that's exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, well, you know, you're in New Jersey. Maybe the Giants. You know, New Jersey guy. I'm Ravens. Yeah. I'm Ravens. Right, he's all Ravens now. But what, I guess what I'm saying is, does your bill have the scope to regulate what we used to call touts? You know, you used to turn on uh, your television on a Saturday or Sunday morning, and you would get these 15 minute pro football talk show and you know jimmy jones would tell you that today's I'm, I'm seven for seven i'm on a hot streak you know call me now you don't see as much of that or at least i don't i don't see any of it that connected to the actual licensees that's sort of a different thing so are we going to be able to regulate those people or just the people who have a commercial relationship with one of our licensees and if that's the answer it's just commercial relationship with licensees are we aware of any of that today in maryland Sure. Yes. Uh, our, our company does that uh, with respect to touts. And what um, what what I would say is the um, the main uh, aspect that we look at is the relationship with the licensee. So at, as we have to define a population somewhere and starting with that because of all the affiliate relationships that feed into the operator you get a large subset of these touts who are using it as a way to monetize their own business to say, not only do I like, uh, I don't want to offend anyone in here, but just, not only- take the Ravens. Yeah. No, <laughs> not me, I'm a Steelers fan, but that's okay. Not, not only, yeah, yeah, yeah not, on, not only do I like the Orioles, but here's, here's an affiliate link to go bet the, bet the actual link, or bet the actual game on X sports book. So, so what, what we look at is that, that full scope of relationship around there. So yes, it would, it would be content creators. Um, what we would look at would be content creators in-house to the sports book, affiliated out to it. And anyone outside of that scope um, starts to be fostered along into better behavior because they don't have a health inspector grade on their restaurant window. Okay, and then the only other question I had, Senator Zucker, there's also, or at least there seems to be something in the bill about, uh, independent of this thing that we've been talking about, this, this independent evaluator, that would allow for the facility, uh, of someone who's filed an application for a facility to amend their application to, to physically move it, is that still part of the bill? Yeah, I don't believe so. Okay, I mean, that was in the, the, the fiscal note analysis that had said there was a section, but maybe you guys took that out. Are you talking about SWORC? Yeah. 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 I was just going to read it that said uh, uh, SLGCC and the SWORC may consider a request oh, that's to amend. That's uncodified. That's uncodified. Okay. No, it's, just, it's just intent language, but it's uncodified. Okay. No. But that's the, there is some language in there that would relate to the ability to amend. You know, I got the application right. license to go to site a and i really don't have a site oh yeah yeah site that a. oh so i, uh, I apologize yeah so that so that was yeah sorry there's been a lot a lot of things going on today so sure. um you that was another working on that capital budget oh my like gosh it's, this is this is job. it right here so uh um but um but anyway so that was um what happened was there was an end there was a facility that uh had per a minority business that had purchased a license that had purchased a license and they no longer use it at their current place, so it just gives that licensee an opportunity to move it uh, because Swark needed our permission to do that. Okay, I mean yeah. that's just a fundamental. I, I'm a little concerned with I, with Swark that we don't seem to be having these licensees going sort of across the state. No, this they is this is for free. one facility. It'll just get them through the loophole. Yeah, because that's we fine. needed to we needed to do it in statute, okay. unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that, delegate. So. Just so I'm clear, because uncodified language does have intent and meaning. So it gives that one operator an opportunity to move, although all these other operators have to go through a process. No, they've already been, oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I apologize. No, yeah, no, well, they've gone through the process. So I feel like this one operator might be subverting the process. Like everyone's already gone through this process about where they can be, where these licenses can be. So this one operator gets an opportunity to say, forget the process, you get to go wherever. Well, if that's, if that's how it came across, that's not, I apologize. So it's, it's they went through the process, 
they're, my understanding is they're gonna have to go through the process again, but they don't have to lose their license fee. Okay. They paid $50,000 for the license fee and they don't wanna lose it. Okay. Yeah. Correctly, so the new location, the SWARC would still have to approve, Correct. hey, we're going to place B. Correct. It just doesn't strip them and say, because you didn't open a place A, you don't have a license. That's my understanding, they would have lost the money. Okay. Okay, so SWARC still has that regulatory yeah. role to say, you, you have to go there, it just, okay. Yeah, they just didn't have the unilateral authority without our consent okay. on it. Any other questions? No. Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 621, Senator Zucker 624. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 624 is an uh, exact cross file of House Bill 1074. I just wanted to thank uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Delegate Daryl Barnes, who has just an amazing champion on this bill. And yep, hey. <laughs> and, and Delegate Barnes, I just want to let you know that has never happened to me before, all right? <laughs> so I got to, I got to, I'm going to, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to applaud all of you for your help on this bill that passed unanimously. The, uh, the only difference between uh, Delegate Barnes's bill and this one is um, the con everything is the same. It's just a little change in the short title. The reason why is it's uh, named after uh, someone who, uh, our Senate administrator, uh, her husband uh, died from a cardiac arrest in a restaurant, so we named the short title after him. But the bills are, and the bills are in the complete same posture. Nothing's changed. And Again, I just can't thank uh, Delegate Barnes enough for his uh, leadership and partnership on this bill. And with that, Madam Chair, I ask for a favorable report on both bills. He fought like a tiger for that bill, man. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Okay, thank you, Senator Zucker. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 624, Senate Bill 125, Senator Hayes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the Ways and Means Committee. I apologize for my tardiness. We were on the floor a little late, and I'm running between three different committees this afternoon, but it is a pleasure to be here to present to you Senate Bill 125. I'm Senator Antonio Hayes from Baltimore City, District 40, for the record. Um, Madam Chair, uh, th this bill, which I'll explain in just a second, is the byproduct of a collaboration of um, young entrepreneurs throughout well, entrepreneurs, let's not put up, like, not young, but entrepreneurs throughout our state that are looking to make a difference um, in the technology world. Many of them have joined us here in the chambers today. I'm just going to ask them to stand since this is sponsor only, just so you could uh, know that they are all here in support of it. But Madam Chair, Senate Bill 125 establishes the Business Diversity Program in the Maryland Technology Development Corporation for the purpose of providing grants to qualify incubator programs to establish diverse and effective business incubators in the state. The bill establishes requirements for grants, including limits on the amount and duration of the grant. The bill also establishes the Business Diversity Incubator Fund and authorizes an appropriation of $1 million to fund in 2025. It authorizes, it does not mandate, just for the record. TEDCO is required to, to report special, specific programmatic information to the General Assembly. This bill seeks to create equity in tech by addressing the wide chasm that exists in terms of investment into companies run by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. Myself and a cross file delegate Jazz Lewis have worked with stakeholders and TEDCO on a change of this bill. This is a priority of the Legislative Black Caucus of Maryland. Um, Madam Chair and colleagues, I urge a favorable report with the sponsor amendments on Senate Bill 125. Questions, Delegate Fair. Thank you, Senator. I really appreciate you bringing this bill forward. Uh, my husband works for one of those uh, historically disenfranchised, uh, you know, companies that works in tech, and it's such a critical aspect of understanding the importance of bringing up these issues. I did want to um, ask or inquire and get your thoughts on. Uh, the last page of the bill, um, on line three, on line three, it says that the governor may include Correct. an appropriation of one hundred one million. And obviously, we have the may shall conversation here all the time. Yes, I'd like to know your thoughts on that language and whether you would like to see it different or if you're fine with the way it is. 
No, and thank you, uh, Delegate Fair, for that question. And, and happy to know that uh, y your partner in this, sharing this, there's, there's so many entrepreneurs throughout the state that could really benefit from a tool like this. Um, we have had this debate as well over in the Senate versus Shell versus May. We're completely fine as a posture on what it's in. We understand that um, resources may not be as plentiful as we thought um, coming into session, um, but we plan to continue to work with the administration and TechCo, who's very supportive of this legislation, um, to make sure that this opportunity is available for our entrepreneurs. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you again for bringing Thank the bill Thank you, forward. sir. I appreciate you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That thank concludes you. the testimony on Senate Bill 125. Senate Bill 640, Senator Jackson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Senator Michael Jackson, District 27, on behalf of Senate Bill 640. Senate Bill 640 passed unanimously out of the Senate only amend it to add sponsors to the bill and to install a sunset on the uh, piece of legislation. Senate Bill 640 is a bill that simply exempts electricity used for agricultural purposes for the state sales and use tax for farmers, our small farmers. This exemption would include activities related to raising livestock, the preparation of soil and planting servicing, harvesting, storing, cleaning, drying, and transportation of seeds and crops. Residential electricity use and electricity use for manufacturing are already tax exempt for the larger uh, farmers or the larger industries, uh, the larger farmers within the industry. These small farmers have multiple meters attached to their farms and subsequently have to pay the sales and use tax for the smaller farmers. Uh, as you know, Maryland depends on our local farmers and the benefits of their labor. These local farmers face hard consequences in competing with larger agricultural manufacturing operations. Uh, the bill comes from a place of trying to give our farmers, those who have worked hard, particularly during our COVID uh, years, couple of years, uh, to make sure our families are fed. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, I will stand for questions. We think this is a great bill for our agricultural community and our local farmers. Thank you, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, thank Senator you very Jackson. Much. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 640. Uh, is there anyone here for Senate Bill 661? Is there a Justin Hayes? Yep, come on up. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Justin Hayes, and I'm the Director of State Affairs for the Comptroller's Office. Uh, thank you for providing time for me to discuss Senate Bill 661, which, uh, as you may know, passed the Senate unanimously as well. Um, you have uh, already heard the cross-file of this bill, which uh, I, I believe uh, did not pass out of this committee, but I just wanted to first note for the record that the Department of Labor has adjusted their uh, original data for this bill, which brought down the fiscal note by about uh, $8 million from $20 million to $12 million. And uh, this bill corrects an issue with the provision of the 2021 Relief Act that exempted unemployment insurance from state taxes. And the issue reaches every corner of the state and could now impact more than 58,000 Marylanders. Uh, those of Marylanders were effectively denied approximately $250 per person uh, based on the, the errors that, uh, that happened at the Maryland Department of Labor and under the previous administration. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but I, we would urge a favorable report on SB 661. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 661. Senate Bill 537, Patty Horton is here for Senator King. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Patty Horton for Senator King. It's been almost 13 years since the opening of the first uh, video lottery operation in Cecil County. By law, video lottery operation licenses expire 15 years from the date they were licensed by the State Lottery and Gaming Control Commission. And two years prior to the expiration, the licensee must file notice of intent to renew. So the first licensee must file intent to renew this year. 
Senate Bill 537 will clarify the process for license renewal by allowing the State Lottery and Gaming Control Commission to establish a renewal process and set the licensing fee. The Commission will also set an appeal process should an application be denied. It's important to ensure that our casinos are continuing to meet the rigorous requirements established under Maryland law, and we want to ensure that the processes are done in a timely manner so there will be no disruption in funds to the Education Trust Fund. So on behalf of Senator King, I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 537. Okay, uh, Delegate Ebersol has a question. I was afraid he would. <laughs> <laughs> just checking, <laughs> just for the clarification of the committee, this bill doesn't have any fees established in its code, right? That's correct. And it's would, leaving it up to the commission to establish those. And the commission could charge $0 or $10 million? It, it could, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 537. Senator King, again, Senate, Senate Bill 691. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Patty Horton for Senator King. Senate Bill 691 is a cross file of HB 1064 and addresses the taxation of home amenity rentals, which is a fairly new segment of the short-term rental industry. Several years ago, the General Assembly put into place a taxing system for short-term rentals like Airbnb. Senate Bill 691 copies that model for the General Assembly put it, that the General Assembly put into place for taxing short-term rentals like Airbnb and makes home amenity rentals as it defined in the bill subject to the sales tax. The only change from the Airbnb model is that the county and municipal rate was halved in order to take into account that home amenity rental, rentals are usually just two or three hours while a short-term rental is at least 20 hours or more. Simply put, this bill puts home amenity rentals, which are growing in popularity, on par with similar short-term rentals from a taxing standpoint. Again, on behalf of Senator King, I respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 691. Again, Senator King, Senate Bill 692. Thank you again, Patty Horton for Senator King. Senate Bill 692, which is cross-filed with HB 1064, will expand on previous legislation by providing a credit against the corporate income tax for the purchase of zero and hybrid emissions mobile machinery for use in a taxpayer's business or for rental or lease to the general public. The Senate added some technical amendments to the bill, but they also reduced the time frame for the credit from 10 years to five years. If, and now I'm speaking for Senator King and not for me, which <laughs> she would say, if we are serious about making the transition to greener technologies, we would need to provide meaningful and comprehensive incentives. This legislation will encourage businesses to transition to zero emission fleets, and so on behalf of Senator Quest, a favorable report on Senate Bill 692. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Delegate Buckle. Mm -hmm. And, and if you don't know this, ma'am, that's fine. We heard a version of this bill, HB 1181. Is the Senate bill the same, to your knowledge, from what the bill we heard, or did the Senate make amendments to the original draft of the bill? So this bill was cross filed with 1064. I am not familiar with okay. 1162. Uh, 1181. Okay. Did you make any changes to the bill from the one it was originally filed? Do you know the Senate? Yes, there were. They um, reduced the time frame from the credit from 10 to five years, and they also um, made just some technical amendments to the bill as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 692. Senate Bill 783, is anyone here from Senator Hester's office? Okay, Senate Bill 865, Senate, Senator Quarterman. I think this bill has a horrible cross file. <laughs> He's talking. He didn't even hear my joke. He's not even paying attention. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Senator Paul Quarterman, District 2, representing Washington and Frederick County. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Go here a second. Um, 
Senate Bill 865. Uh, as you indicated before, you guys have heard this bill. You heard the cross files brought by a member of your committee. Uh, would you like to say that the, I don't know myself, but the member of the cross file were very, very much appreciative of the contributions you guys made with this legislation last year towards Western Maryland. Uh, and this bill is basically clean up. You guys have heard it. It passed unanimously out of this committee. It passed unanimously in the, in the Senate. So we asked for a favorable report. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 865. Is anybody here from Senator Salling's office? Okay, so we just have Senator Salling, Senate Bill 907, and Senator Hester, Senate Bill 783. Let's just pause, everybody. Okay, folks, thanks for running over there. You can catch your breath while I announce your bill. Oh, wow. Senator Salling, Senate Bill 907, whenever you're ready and can be. Thank breathe. you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and good committee. I think we have so many appropriations, and thank you also. Uh, for the record, I'm Senator John Ray Salling, and I want to thank you for the opportunity speaking to you about Senate Bill 907 for your approval. Throughout the years, Maryland has had hosts of companies and producers to come to Maryland. Most notable, the House of Cards, The Wire, The West Wing, Elmo's Fire, Patriots Game, and Wedding Crashers. Uh, the bill, this bill, would give the gov governor the option to set aside $5 million in the budget to assist with production of costs of entertainment and film project in the state. A maximum is $200 for each project. Of the, for the $5 million. I did put an amendment in to make sure that this was not a shall, but it's a may. It gives the governor the option if he wants to do this or not. So it's up to him. I'd rather do it that way. I do not want to burden down our, our government. I don't want to burden down our, our governor. 
And this bill, we're bringing a lot more artists, a lot more entertainment, maybe in your neighborhood, in your community, and would build the economy. And I think it's a boost and an opportunity. And I want to thank you. It was unanimous in committee, it was unanimous on the floor, and I hope it will be unanimous here. I want to thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Delegate Buckle. Hey, Senator, how are you? I know, you're, well. I know you're, you know, get your breath there for a second. <laughs> I, I just had a question. Sure. H how is this different or how does it relate in juxtaposition to the existing film production activity income tax credit? Senator Griffith was here earlier. Our committee's already passed a version of that that I think yeah. raised that to, I think, $15 million. George or someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's $15 million. Is this program that you're proposing in addition to the $5 million or $15 million, does it operate separately from that, or how would it work? I, I, I know somewhat. I mean, Senator Griffin's also, she had the bill in b and in my committee, mm -hmm. and it's a great bill, um, and I'm, I'm hoping it does pass. But this is an add-on. This is an opportunity for anybody that would like to come in. It's a fun and, again, option, may, but if they would come in and they would like to produce, entertain, it's a $200 max out of $5 million. $200,000 per max. production. Per production, yes. Per, per applicant. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Senator. Thank you, and have a fantabulous day. <laughs> thank you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 907. Senate Bill 783. Uh, we are still waiting to see if someone's coming over. Apparently, the Senator will be here in a few minutes, so just take a little. That was two minutes ago. Let's take a little break, and then we have a quick voting session. Hi, Senator Hester, Senate Bill 783. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Wilkins, members of the committee. Sorry to be a few minutes late. I thought I was dead last. So, um, <laughs> you guys move fast over here. I'm getting my exercise. I was, I was. I was in another committee, went back over there, and then got the call. So here I am. Um, well, thank you for the record, Senator Katie Fry Hester, um, for your consideration of Senate Bill 783. This bill will enable our states to more effectively manage and redevelop large state-owned complexes. Um, in my district, and I can pass around this report, um, or used to be my district in, in Sykesville, we've got the, the, the old Springfield Hospital, which they're trying to um, redevelop. Um, and so the bill does two things as amended. First, it extends the sunset for the catalytic revitalization tax credit for an additional four years. And second, it directs the smart growth subcabinet to develop a revised preservation and reuse implementation plan. And just because this bill is not cross-filed, I thought I would give you just a touch of context. In uh, 2019, the General Assemb Assembly commissioned the Department of Planning to figure out an efficient ongoing process for evaluating these historic state properties. So we're talking about things like uh, the, the Sykesville Hospital, the Crownsville Hospital, Bainbridge Naval Training Center, and Springfield in my district. Um, and I, I'll leave this report with you guys if you want to read it. It's also linked in my testimony. And so in 2021, then, after we produced this report, we, um, we implemented the, the catalytic revitalizing tax credit as a pilot program to just see how it, it worked. It provides a power, and we found that it does provide a powerful tool for spurring private sector investment and reducing uh, long-term government expenses. I think Crownsville was spending $2 million a year to um, mow the lawn and secure the facilities um, before it was, it was sold. Um, You'll, you'll see in my testimony, I've also linked the Senate testimony from Warfield, which is in my district, and from Fort Ritchie, 
in Washington County, which got the last uh, tax credit. And the tax credit, for those of you who don't know, is $15 million, which is a big tax credit for big projects. Um, at the same time, I've been working closely with the Department of Housing and Community Development on the second recommendation, and this is the Historic Properties Disposition and Preservation Team. Um, as you can see um, in my testimony, I linked a memo um, from uh, Secretary Holt, uh, which in 2021 created this team and charged it with identifying these state-owned historic complexes and developing a plan for their future preservation and disposition. And ultimately, this team did not materialize um, under the previous administration. However, this work is really important, and I've talked to the new administration and the different agencies involved, and they're interested in moving forward. So basically, um, what, as amended, what this bill will do, in addition to extending the tax credit, it will direct the Smart Growth Subcabinet to review the previous administration's work in this space and develop a revised implementation plan by December. Um, and so I, I fundamentally believe that this bill will make our state more effectively uh, able to manage and redevelop these large state-owned complexes, and it's a triple win for the uh, economic development, historic preservation, and smart growth. And for these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions, Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you said large. Um, would this apply, for example, there's an armory in Catonsville that is no longer being used by the state. Um, would we be able to uh, apply it to this building as well? I believe you would, but I'd have to double check with it, the department, but yes. It doesn't have to do with its status or its value or its size? It's, uh, it's previously owned state historic complexes. So I guess part of it depends on whether or not the state still owns it or it's been, um, divested in some way. Okay. But so it has to be divested to be available? For the tax credit? Yes. You said previously owned. I was confused. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know if the state would give a tax credit to itself. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, um, let's follow up then on it, uh, whenever the chair wants to recognize you. Delegate also. Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. I really appreciate this bill. And, and how long would the uh, tax credit be extended? So I know that some of the projects that had hoped maybe to be able to use the catalytic tax credit because of the complexity of the projects just can't get off the ground and accrue the, the expenses to offset the credit against. How long does this um, uh, sort of extend the program out? So as amended, it extends it for four years. Um, I would be happy to, I mean, we could, take, we could take the sunset off or you could make it 10 years. Is, I'm is, open. Is there a yearly cap on how much of the catalytic tax credit can be offered, whether in aggregate or by project? So it's $15 million every two years. And the whole $15 million has to go to one project. One project. And, and so, for example, when Warfield got it, um, I mean, it, it, it's so large compared to our other tax credits because there are like 16 buildings. Right. And Fort Ritchie, I don't know how many buildings, but it's like an Quite entire a you know, community. So um, that is that is specifically designed because these projects are so big and it's really hard to pencil out without the tax credit. And, and it takes so long to kind of get them that if, you know, I get the tax credit, but then I don't actually get to do the work, then you have a problem, I guess, looking down the road. Ex ex exactly. Okay. Um, the, the, you will see a couple of amendments that we've submitted. Those are based on what DHCD has learned in the past four years, and uh, those have to do with uh, transferability and also um, when the credit, when the developer can pull down the credit. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to wait for the end, the amendments from DHCD, I believe, will do it in chunks. So you can do it in, in sort of tranches as you're doing the redevelopment work. You qualify to, to accrue a part of the credit and you will have the ability to transfer some of the credits so that they have more economic value to the developer? So um, I had wished DHCD could be here to answer the really technical okay. questions, but I'd be happy to connect you to yeah, them. That's okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Delegate Hornberger. Thank you. And, and this is a great bill, and I've, I've seen it work um, in your district. Of course, Bainbridge is in, in my district, and a lot of things happening there. So in, in following up on Delegate Ebersol's question, there are scenarios where a developer will come in and do a perpetual lease on state-owned property, build out, uh, you know, units, buildings, et cetera. They can still capture the tax credit even though they're not owning the parcel. Is that, it, is that a question? Yeah. Is that, is that the understanding? So if, 
if it were to stay in the ownership of the state and developer was to come and build something on there and exercise a 20 year lease with the state, they still utilize the tax credit. So I do not believe, I mean, I think in principle that would be in keeping with the intent of the bill. Right. I don't believe that's it has, how it is currently drafted because we okay. would have to decide whether it was 20 years or 50 years and I don't think that's in the bill. Right, so I'm saying could they get it on the front end for the development cost? I think it's an interesting idea, but I'm so, I was simply extending the yeah, tax the, credit. The current one, okay. Yeah. All right, well, we'll talk to council and, and, and clarify that. Thank you. I think it's a good idea. Yep. Any further okay. questions? Okay, thank you, Senator Hester. Could I, could I say one more thing, Madam mm -hmm. Chair? Just following up on your point, when we did this study, and I'll leave the study with you because you're asking the questions, we, we talked to Rhode Island, and Rhode Island has moved entirely to 50-year ground leases. They're no longer st selling their state-owned property anymore because they want to make money off the lease. So it's a good question. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. That concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 783. Okay, folks, let's take five minutes, and then we're going to have a quick voting session, okay? Thank you.